Cardo's push was an event that took place in Vietnam where an F4 that was badly battle damaged pushed another F4 80 nautical miles so that all four airmen could eject. At the end of the day, the Air Force's top brass said that this act should be punished because it was reckless and showed a lack of flight discipline from Bob Pardo, who was the pilot of the F-4, who pushed the other F-4 to safety. The squadron commander of Bob Pardo at the time, though, denied the top brass's request for discipline and instead submitted Pardo for multiple air medals. And this squadron commander was none other than, you guessed it, Robin Olds. So it's clear that Robin Olds and Bob Pardo, they don't read books. They stare them down until they give them the information that they need. These two men had ice in their veins, and at the end of the day, this story is one for the record books. So stay to the end of this video to see how the story plays out. Oh, and check out Patreon, Max Afterburner, where I have dogfights that are inspired by Robin Olds. Robin Olds basically said that fighter pilots need to know BFM, basic fighter maneuvers, better than anything else in the aircraft because they need to go back to the basics. So throughout these dogfights, you'll see me fight MiG-29s, Su-27s, Su-30s, and other Russian aircraft. You'll see me use the gun only and essentially do my best to become a surgeon and get one shot, one kill. I'll let you check that out on Patreon to see how it goes. And then check out maxafterburner.co to grab some t-shirts, some nice tri-blend t-shirts. They come in midnight black, salmon, and tomato, all the different colors that you've been telling me that you want. So check that out. Let's dive into this epic story. This airstrike happened in March of 1967 where two F-4s were tasked to take out a steel mill that was crucial to Vietnamese aggression towards American forces. It was north of Hanoi in a very contested piece of airspace where anti-aircraft fire was just as common as birds flying throughout the jungle in Vietnam. The two F-4s made their way into the valley where the target was, and both F-4s were badly damaged. However, one was damaged worse than the other. The lead aircraft flown by pilot Earl Amon was damaged to the point where fuel just began dumping out of the aircraft through multiple points in the wing and fuselage where it was hit by anti-aircraft fire. The following aircraft, piloted by Pardo, was then shot as well, but only one hole made it through the fuselage in that jet. Albeit it was one hole, fuel still began to leak out of Pardo's jet, but it wasn't dumping out of his jet quite as bad as it was out of Amon's aircraft. But it was clear to Pardo that Amon's aircraft had no ability to make it back to safe territory or even to a tanker where they could refuel and try to top it off because fuel was dumped out of the fuselage so fast. And the aircraft that Bob Pardo was flying and his Wizzo Steve Wayne was in almost as bad of shape, but it was in slightly better shape. So Pardo had the idea that he would do whatever it took to get Amon back to safety. He's quoted as saying, I just went into battle with these two guys. How could I ever not do everything that it took to get them from not being captured by the Vietnamese? So Pardo said, I'm gonna try to give you a push fly that jet as smooth as you've ever flown it before. This just shows that when God said, let there be light, Pardo said, say please. Pardo's initial plan was to snug his nose up against the tail of the F-4 that was in front of him that was rapidly descending at 3,000 feet per minute. But when he approached the tail, he realized that the turbulence was so bad that he literally couldn't get within 10 feet of that aircraft. And I've experienced that real time on the Thunderbirds when you try to get directly behind another aircraft, the jet wash coming off that jet can not only cause compressor stalls in your jet, but the air is so violent that it literally creates a bow wave combined with engine an exhaust coming out of that massive engine that just pushes you away from that aircraft. So basically coming up right behind another aircraft and trying to push them, while that might be the first thought you have as an aviator, it's definitely not gonna work. And that's exactly what Pardo discovered. So Pardo had another plan. He said, jettison your parachute. Parachutes were used on F4s to slow them down after landing. And once the parachute had been jettisoned, it left a basic flat plate in the place where the parachute had been. So he thought that that might be an option as well. But that provided just as much turbulence as what would it have been to push that aircraft on the tail. It was just slightly below the tail, but even being that close to the tail and the engines, there just was way too much turbulence for Pardo to push from that point. So they were essentially back to square one. 
But the fact that Pardo and Wayne tried to do this to Oman's aircraft basically showed that they have a cup full of nails in the morning instead of coffee. So Pardo went to plan B. He decided that he would try to fly underneath Oman's aircraft and basically carry the plane piggyback style to safety. But when he got about a foot underneath him, he noticed that the nose of his aircraft started pulling up and up and up closer to the fuselage of Amon's jet. At this point, Pardo realized if he kept going up, he was going to crack his canopy and potentially jam his own canopy into place so that if they had to eject, which he essentially knew they would because both jets were so badly battle damaged that the canopy itself wouldn't deploy. And that's going to be a big problem. Goose from Top Gun, we're looking at you. But again, the fact that he just tried to go underneath that aircraft and carry it piggyback style shows that Pardo doesn't sleep. He just waits. But at this point, things were going from bad to worse. The speed of the descent had increased from 3,000 feet per minute to four to 5,000 feet per minute, and the aircraft that Amon was piloting was going down extremely rapidly. So as Pardo began to back out, Wayne saw the tail hook hanging down from Amon's aircraft, and he noticed that that might be a possibility. So he said, hell, that might work, let's give it a try. So Pardo radioed to Amon and said, put your hook down, I'm gonna try to push you from there. Amon basically said, what, say again? And Pardo, with a demeanor in his voice that meant he meant business, said, put your hook down now, I'm gonna push you from there. So the hook came down and Pardo placed the steel tip of the hook directly against his windscreen and began pushing the aircraft. Immediately upon beginning to push the aircraft, Pardo noticed an ominous spider-like web forming in his own canopy as the canopy glass began to shatter. Luckily, the canopy glass, especially at the front of the F4, is made from five different layers of plexiglass, glass, polymer coating that basically allowed for the glass to crack in while not completely breaking. But Pardo knew that if he kept pushing harder and harder that the glass might completely break. But at this point, Pardo realized that he had slowed the descent from 5,000 feet per minute to a measly 1,000 feet per minute. So he knew that this was working. They began to see Vietnam disappear beneath them and they made their way towards safe territory. But the challenge wasn't over because the tail hook was meant to switch Way from side to side to catch a cable upon landing. So every 30 seconds or so, the tail hook would pop loose from the windscreen on Pardo's jet. And the cracks in Pardo's canopy were getting much worse. So Pardo put the hook against a steel plate just below the windscreen and continued to push. Even that steel plate had pressure against the canopy, which continued to send cracks up and down Pardo and Wayne's canopy. As they watched the cracks form, they knew that time was running low. But this just shows that even despite the cracks that Pardo and Wayne continued, that these two men are so strong, they drink napalm to fight their heartburn. And then things went from bad to worse. You might think that things couldn't get any worse at this point, but lo and behold, as Pardo's pushing Amon's jet, his left engine catches on fire from catching fog that was falling off of his own aircraft due to the anti-aircraft fire that they had taken. So going against procedures that are written in pretty much every book about the F-4, they decided to restart the engine that was damaged with foreign objects. What this meant was this engine was going to continue to provide thrust, but it was going to essentially destroy destroy the entire engine and potentially throw shrapnel into the compartment leading to the other engine in the F4 and give them no ability for any type of power. But at this point, Pardo knew he had no other option, that he needed to do whatever it took to keep power and keep thrust pushing forward so that he could push himself and Amon's damaged F4 into safe territory. So Pardo ran the engine until Wayne noticed that the temperature gauge on the left engine was pegged at more than a thousand degrees Celsius for more than 10 minutes. At this point, they knew if they kept going, their entire jet might explode in mid-flight. As North Vietnam passed out of sight, Pardo moved away from the tail hook and directed Amon and his weapon systems operator to eject. 
They did just that. And shortly thereafter, Pardo's jet being starved of fuel in both the left and right engine turned into a glider. Their F4 was basically a hunk of metal shaped like a brick flying through the air that was dropping at more than 7,000 feet per minute. At this point, Pardo and Wayne pulled the ejection handles and joined the other two aviators flying underneath their silk sheets as they made their way down into the jungle below. Pardo's push as the feat had become known after lasted for about 25 minutes and the aircraft had traveled more than 80 nautical miles into safe territory. Pardo, Wayne, Amon, and Houghton, who was Amon's weapon systems operator, ended up slightly injuring their backs in the ejection, but after they landed, they still had to evade in the jungles below. They moved for more than 10 nautical miles before they could be rescued by rescue helicopters, and that night, they made their way into a club at the base in forward deployed territory. Pardo is quoted as saying, that night we got to the club and we didn't have to pay for a drink all night long. We partied till midnight. No big deal. We were just shot down a few hours ago and we almost got captured by the Vietnamese, but we're going to party. We're going to go big or go home. And then Pardo was quoted as saying, the next day, Steve Wayne and I, we got another mission. And the target was that same steel mill in North Vietnam. This just showed that Pardo and Wayne were the types of pilots that could point at an enemy jet with their finger and shoot it down by saying, bang. And it's clear that Pardo and Wayne counted to infinity, twice. And this just proves that Pardo could slam revolving doors. Pardo and Wayne don't go hunting because the word hunting implies there could be failure. Instead, they go killing. So it's interesting to see that despite this effort being successful of Pardo pushing Amon and Houghton into safety where they could eject and not be captured and be prisoners of war for years, the top brass in the military still tried to discipline them. But what it took was a middle manager with heart, a squadron commander with moxie, with fortitude, who knew that in the heat of battle, you're gonna do everything you can to achieve the mission and bring everyone home safely. At the end of the day, Pardo's desire to bring home his teammates who were in the heat of battle, who were in combat with them, is respected by others who have the same level of game. It goes to the mentality of game recognizes game. And Robin Olds, being one of the best squadron commanders of all time, and ultimately the best fighter pilot who's ever existed, saw the game that Pardo and Wayne had to get the other aircraft to safety, and the pride in the ability to bring everyone home that should be reinstilled throughout the entire force. So the fact that Robin Olds submitted Pardo and Wayne for awards instead of discipline just showed the rest of the squadron that if they use the fighter pilot mindset of do everything you can to win and bring everyone home, you will be rewarded. And at the end of the day, even the top brass in the Pentagon knows that this is what should be rewarded, but it comes down to them saying, well, we don't want to encourage reckless behavior, but sometimes positively reckless behavior is just what you need to be an effective fighter pilot. Thanks so much for watching everybody. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and comment below. Watch another video. That would mean a lot to me. Check me out on Patreon. It's Max Afterburner there. And then pop over to maxafterburner.co and grab some shirts, some nice tri-blend shirts that I'm sure you'll enjoy. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you on the next video.